Namaskar. I would like to begin by thanking all the viewers who joined me in this talk and to thank the Indian National Center for inviting me to give this talk. I am entitling this talk, India International Center and the Attributes of an Indian Modernism. The search for an Indian identity in modern architecture is something that has intrigued me since my early years in architecture school. Over the years that I have practiced as an architect, I have tried to address this search through my work as well as through my academic life as a teacher and researcher in the field of architecture and design. And I consider the architect of the Indian International Center, Joseph Allen Stein, to be the one who showed me a way to resolve this search into a journey. I'm deeply thankful to the India International Center for having provided me with an opportunity to talk about what I consider to be a valid way for modern Indian architecture to have evolved. So with these words, I begin the PowerPoint presentation as well. So the thing I want to state right away is that what I have to say is a very personal point of view, and I do not wish to validate any of the things I say with footnotes or statistics, as I would if I were to write a typical academic essay. With this brief introduction, I would now like to place my arguments and reasoning before you all. The industrialization of processes of traditional production and the invention of completely new products and technology has changed the way humankind had lived for thousands of years. We all know the problems that we have in, uh, inherited with the industrial age, and this is not the space to enter into that discussion. Instead, I would like to look very briefly for the reason behind the starting of the modern architecture movement in Europe, which then subsequently found its way into India. I view the modern movement in world architecture as the vehicle by which architects in the West adapted to new materials, construction technology, and the design of entirely new building types that the Industrial Revolution had created some 200 years ago. Modernism in architecture gained impetus in India mostly after independence. Pre-1947 examples of modern architecture in India were few, commissioned mostly by a few of the princely states, while the neoclassical style of architecture is what was favored by the British colonial government. And after independence, as a deliberate departure from this mode, modernism became the official architectural style promoted by the central government and by the Indian state as a whole. In the early days, several architects from the West were invited by the government to help build India and transit to the modern age. Indian architects were trained to practice modernist architecture in colleges, both here and abroad, and thus modernism spread across the country to become the accepted standard. Among the various architects invited to work in India, the most flamboyant and well-known was Le Corbusier. However, in my opinion, the two architects who left a more relevant mark in India were Laurie Baker and Joseph Allenstein. Baker's work was based in Kerala, while Stein's work was based largely in Delhi. I would like to focus on Mr. Stein's work as I find it closer to my own understanding of architecture and something that I am familiar with, since I have experienced a few of his buildings firsthand over a long period of time, and also because I trained at his office upon graduating as an architect. The two buildings by Mr. Stein that I have experienced 
the most are the Triveni Kala Sangam and India International Center. I used to visit Triveni every evening to explore the place much before I knew who built it. And for that matter, even before I joined SPA to study architecture in 1977. Triveni had begun to influence me from the day I walked into its lobby and exhibition halls, and then into the open air theater to sit on the grassy steps or under the pergolas of the terrace cafe to sip Nimbupani. Triveni was like a magnet that would draw me in during my aimless evening walks, often chatting with a friend who, like me, stayed close by in Bengali market. It was much later during college days that I came to know of Mr. Stein. Otherwise, for the uninitiated me, Triveni seemed to have created itself and did not seem to be anything like any of the buildings that existed around it. During his retirement, when I went to meet Mr. Stein at his home in Maharani Bagh, I had mentioned that Triveni was my most favorite building and I remember his eyes lighting up and with a smile on his face, he said that it was his favorite as well. It was in my second year in college in 1978 when our studio head, Professor Himangshu Chaya, took our batch to IIC. That first visit I still remember as being an eye-opener to what a gifted architect could achieve. Professor Chaya led us in front from the driveway and asked us to move towards the fountain-like spray far away, pausing every few steps to observe how the viewing frame and the vistas changed as the complex drew us in gradually from the road to the inner courts. We walked past the unusual veranda porch right up to the spray pond behind the lounge where the site of IIC merged with the public gardens and the Lodi tombs. That day, even as a second year student, I realized that I was in a very special space that had been created and crafted by an extraordinary architect. Those days, IIC appeared to me as a quieter, more leisurely and serene place with not quite so many activities as it holds these days. However, what I find extraordinary is that despite more footfalls and many more programs per day, not to mention the iconic IIC annual festival, which transforms the place into a veritable cultural carnival. The architecture of IIC still manages to hold on to the serenity of the place quite effortless. IIC shows a remarkable ability that Mr. Stein had to create a place that is an unobtrusive manner, set the context on a site that would virtually define the way the place was meant to be used. Not many architects display this ability and I believe it comes from the way Mr. Stein worked. I got to experience a little of his methods when I joined his office as a fresh graduate in 1982. I wanted to understand how he put his buildings together and learned by apprenticing in his office. The years I spent in his office was as a as an apprentice was a learning experience that was in many ways necessary for me to become a thinking architect. And the rigor of following a systemized way of designing buildings got ingrained within me forever. His office for those days was a large one with 67 employees. He had all departments ranging from structural to plumbing, electrical and mechanical engineering, all of them worked in tandem under one roof along with the design studio at 5 Sundanagar. All the senior people in the office were very experienced and were all ready to help me learn what I had not in college. The fact that the office had all the departments in-house meant that there was complete coordination and partnership between the architects and the engineers. 
I realized that this was one of the important aspects of the way Mr. Stein developed his designs. His designs were always discussed from the early stages with the head of structures and developed side by side with the architecture department. Quantity surveying was another art. I realized that writing of specifications, often of items that were being experimented upon for the first time by Mr. Stein was very much a part of the process of design development and required an in-depth knowledge of not just how the material and the finishes were to be used, but also to be used in construction. By discussing the way the office functioned, I wanted to demonstrate the fact that Mr. Stein was an architect who went to the very basics of a design process and never hesitated to invent a new way of constructing a building. If he was convinced that the design required such a technique. The IIC is one of his earliest projects built in 1959 when he experimented with prefabricated structural systems, which in many ways defined the way the buildings appear to, to the viewer. Use of prefabricated components to construct a building was a relatively untested method in India at that time. Mr. Stein and his office put together IIC with a high level of quality and precision, whose visible proof we can see in the way that the buildings have hardly weathered over the 60 years of their existence. This needs to be further understood from the comparison that can be drawn with more recent buildings, which seem to start crumbling within just 10 years of their construction. The attention to detail, which can be seen from these drawings archived by Mr. Sudhir Vora for the Council of Architecture. The hand-drawn construction drawings of IIC have been matched with photographs of the relevant parts of the building, which show the amount of research and thought that was given to each detail at the design stage. The level of design detailing that the office of Mr. Stein followed is probably unmatched by any other architect of that period. Every part of the building was examined and resolved through drawings first, double checked, and only then allowed to be issued to site for construction. Very often, full-size mock-ups were constructed of a new detail in the office backyard. This was done for Mr. Stein to be sure about the construction and its functioning before he would allow them to be implemented on site. Mr. Stein had once remarked that a project is made well only when the architect, client, and the contractor are united in trust and understanding and directed by a shared vision. IIC seems to be very much such a project. In one of his interviews recorded by Shalene Sharma in his documentary, Garden of the Heart, Mr. Stein reminiscences about the way IIC began. He talks about how the original site allotted to IIC was at ITO next to the railway tracks, and how he was not convinced that this was a site suitable for the project. He then goes on to relate how Albert Mayer, the architect planner, who had worked on planning Chandigarh in the beginning, urged him to choose a better site. Mr. Stein then selected the current site next to Lodi Gardens, and Prime Minister Nehru expressed a desire to see the site and decided that it was too small and doubled the area allotted. He took this decision despite the fact that C.D. Deshmukh, the founder of IIC, was a political opponent, a situation that would be rather difficult to imagine in today's political climate. This is what Garrett Ekbo, the influential American landscape architect from Berkeley, had to stay, say about Mr. Sign. He moved to an extraordinary career in India. There, he not only produced architecture of exceptional quality and refinement in a long series of important projects, but did so while adjusting and adapting to an entirely different culture, more Eastern than Western, on the other side of the world. 
Mr. Stein has said that he came to India not only because of its rich cultural past, but because of two people who were born in India and whom he respected, Gandhi and Tagore. For Mr. Stein, these two persons had one thing in common, the ability to see beauty in simple things. In Gandhi's case, the beauty of austerity, and in Tagore's, his sensitivity to the simple beauty of nature. Mr. Stein's first assignment in India was to head the Bengal Engineering College's architecture department. The demonstration rural housing project that Mr. Stein and the students of BE College had built was probably the very first work of his in India. And it shows the same concern as all his other projects that followed. All his projects show a careful choice and use of materials and how they should come together in constructing and to create architecture that is understated in its aesthetic expression and at the same time beautiful. The fact that his buildings and the spaces that they create are beautiful can be sensed from the moment we confront them. Even though their overall form appears simple, is the way that the muted colors and textures come together in harmony, composed as classically proportioned masses and planes, which give his buildings their unique identity, as well as their timeless quality. As can be seen at IIC, his concern about the specificity of the site, its location, its environs, the climate of the season, is what has shaped the buildings and the use of the spaces that they enclose. His buildings seem to be a part of the natural organization of the site itself, so much so that even though in mass and shape, they're entirely different from the Lodi tombs that stand across the boundary wall, Mr. Stein's buildings do not seem to be in opposition with them in any way. Rather, they seem to sit in a quiet and companionable way each with their own distinct identity. His concern about integrating nature as a part of the design of his buildings was something that guided a lot of his architectural decisions. He often planted trees himself at specific spots on the site to allow them to grow unhindered. I believe that he designed his buildings around the way trees and plants would begin to grow once the construction was over on site. His ability to look at a project in a holistic way from the macro level of the site planning to the smallest detail, including the design of furniture and interiors of the buildings, created a concerted unity in experiencing his architecture at every level. This then was his hallmark, not because he wished to control his buildings to the last detail, but he, because he was capable of imagining his projects in totality which was inclusive of all aspects of architecture, from its structure to the way a corner of a wall should be dealt with. As a human being, Mr. Stein was very much like his buildings. He was soft-spoken, extremely polite, respectful of anyone he spoke to, caring in a quiet, understated way. I remember that I used to draw crows in my spare time at office on waste sheets of paper, and my colleagues would try and scare me, saying that Mr. Stein would not approve of such an activity. One day, Mr. Stein walked up to me and asked me to come to his office, where he opened up a big box of Karandash sketching pencils, a rare treasure in India in the pre-liberalization period, and he asked me to take any one of them that I wished to draw my crows better. All the qualities I have mentioned are visible in the design of the India International Center, but these attributes can be seen in all the buildings he designed, especially the neighboring ones around IIC, most of which he built over successive years. So much so that in his office, the entire Lodi institutional complex was referred to as Steinabad. For me, his buildings are the answer for what could have been the way that modern Indian architecture could have chosen to evolve with. I like to ask friends, especially if they are architects, who visit the center with me for the first time, 
to guess when the complex was built. And most of them think that it was built as recently as the 1980s or 90s rather than in the 50s. I consider this as a validation of my evaluation of Mr. Stein's architecture. His buildings seem difficult to date and they never seem to go out of fashion. This is because they share the same attributes with other timeless works of architecture. IIC, in my opinion, is one such timeless work. It sits comfortably with its older neighbor, the Lodi Trom across the boundary wall, yet at the same time, it has its own distinct identity and appears fresh, blending in with the seasons as the years go by. While the architecture unequivocally defines IIC as a unique place, it does so without dominating or getting in the way of the multifarious daily activities of the center. Instead, every space transforms with very little effort quite magically to become the appropriate place to host a specific activity. IIC therefore satisfies all the important tenets of modern architecture, and yet it is not similar in any way to the examples of what is called the international style that modernist architects had publicized towards the beginning of the 20th century as the way for architecture to be across the world. We can see the result of such propaganda quite prominently, not very far away from IIC in Gurgaon. IIC, in contrast, is not subservient to styles or trends that the modernist trajectory has been reduced to. Try to modernize IIC or keep it up to date with current trends is, in my opinion, unnecessary and a waste of money. The architecture of the place, that is IIC, will continue to remain relevant in the years to come, imagined as it was by Mr. Stein, and should remain as an example of the possible direction that architecture in India could have taken, but did not. And the result is visible in our heterogeneous and directionless urban scape that we are confronted with every day. I would like to end here by reading a paragraph from the book on Mr. Stein, Building in the Garden by Stephen White, where Mr. Stein is quoted, talking about what he thought about his architecture, a very rare instance where he assesses his own work. And I quote, the relation between regional particularism and what you can call knowledge, skill, and technology, which have no regional boundaries, has always interested me. In other words, we are all of our time, wherever our place is. Many things belong to our time, and many things belong to our place. And I think in a time of complex transition, this becomes a very important thing. How to make a reasonable integration of time and place. I hope that's what we have more or less done with the works that we've been doing. I never think of my work as being either modern or conventional or any label like that. I would like to think that we do good work, good architecture that is appropriate to the time and place. Thank you very much for being with me and hearing me out. I would further like to acknowledge the sources through which I could put together my presentation. And I thank India International Center once more for allowing me to present this talk. Thank you and Namaskar.